When you open your weather app and check the forecast, what you see is information about what weather you might expect in a particular place at a particular time. Usually these predictions are made at most 10 days in advance, but there is always some chance that the weather you see in reality is completely different from what was predicted, and sometimes this can lead to disastrous consequences. An example was the failure of weather forecasts to specify the severity of the Great Storm of 1987, which hit the southeast coast of the United Kingdom, parts of France and the Channel Islands on the night of October 15th. Due to the lack of preparation, there was record damage in the southeast of England, with 18 casualties and the falling of an estimated 15 million trees. This caused major transport delays and damage to power lines, which left thousands of homes without electricity for over 24 hours. That was the worst storm to hit the southeast of England in three centuries. In history, the very first weather predictions were made from the experience of the local community. By seeing what the weather was like on a particular day, you can make a guess at what it would be like the following day. As you can imagine, this isn't a very accurate way of weather forecasting. Today, weather forecasting has become significantly more advanced with improved monitoring and connectivity between weather stations located all over the world. These use instruments and equipment such as barometers for measuring air pressure and anemometers for measuring wind speed to provide information about the atmospheric conditions in real time. This data is then used in computer models that use mathematical equations which describe atmospheric processes to predict the weather in the future. But how are these models developed? What factors and physical processes need to be considered? And why is it so hard to predict the weather? Today, to answer these questions, we have Dr. Hannah Christensen, who is an Associate Professor in Physical Climate at the University of Oxford. Well, a weather model is really a computer program, a computer simulator, which embodies all of our understanding of the physics, which drives, which controls the atmosphere. So it includes uh, all of the physics equations uh, which, which describe how the atmosphere operates. Uh, the most important uh, equations, arguably, are, are called the Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, so the Navier-Stokes equations describe uh, fluid dynamics, where here we're using the word fluid to mean anything that flows. So here we're using um, these equations to describe how the air flows around the surface of the Earth. So we have to write these equations, the Navier-Stokes equations, in such a way that they can describe air that's moving around the surface of a sphere. And very importantly, this sphere is also rotating. So we have to include uh, effects due to the rotation of the Earth. So you, um, perhaps our viewers will have come across terms like the Coriolis effect, the centrifugal force. These all get included into those equations. These are, I mean, these are very important um, effects for us because they, they um, control the way in which weather systems rotate uh, as they move around the Earth. Uh, for example, um, uh, weather systems will rotate in a different orientation in the northern hemisphere as they do in the southern hemisphere. So that's firstly the Navier-Stokes equation. So secondly, then we have the equations uh, which describe thermodynamics. So this is an area of physics which describes how, how heat uh, behaves and interacts with systems. So here our equations of thermodynamics are telling us how, uh, how the air warms, how, how, how warmer air changes its density, this makes it more buoyant, and then uh, we'll see that, that uh, less dense, more buoyant air is more likely to rise. Uh, the next set of physics equations which we need to include are those which describe moisture. So this is obviously very important if we want to predict how much it's going to rain. <laughs> we get a, an interaction of moisture with heat. So this kind of these thermodynamics and moisture are uh, kind of linked to areas. So because if we have um, some humidity in, in, an, in, a, in a parcel of air, um, and, and that parcel maybe cools a bit, we'll get condensation, then we have latent heat release, so it warms the air and you can then get a big uh, thunderstorm developing if you have a lot of humidity. It's actually a very uh, difficult uh, part of the um, part of physics to, to understand and to include in the model, because really what we're trying to do here is understand how tiny droplets of water uh, form uh, and interact with each other, how these convert into ice, how they aggregate and then fall out as rain. So this is, this is a part of physics called microphysics in the model and it's extremely complicated. And then lastly, of course, we need to include radiation. So how the, sun, how the sun's radiation interacts with the atmosphere, 
it interacts with clouds, warms the surface. And it's the biggest source of heat for our model. And how do you get the input variables for these weather models and to be able to run these simulations? To run our simulation, what we really need is an, is an estimate of the main variables, the main, um, and the main variables we're interested in, so temperature, wind speeds, humidity. We need an estimate of all of these variables at every point over the Earth and at every height extending from the surface into space. And so obviously we can't actually go out with a thermometer and take those measurements. Um, but what we, what we make use of then is satellite data. Uh, satellite data, air, air, um, aircraft data, weather balloon data, and there's a huge number of um, ground-based weather stations. Even members of the public have signed up to, to provide uh, estimates from their own weather station in their garden, and this all gets built into our models. We take on board about 40 million observations every day into our forecasts. But I suppose the problem is that we, you know, even with all this data, we don't have an estimate at every height in the atmosphere and every point over the Earth. So what we do is we, we blend the observational data with the equations of physics embodied in our model. So we blend these two sources of information and, and by doing so we can come up with a coherent set of starting conditions for our forecast. Um, and as you mentioned, 40 million sets of data, that's quite a big number. Um, so how long do these weather models take to run then? Well, they'll take as long as you let them, really. Um, <laughs> so, um, I mean, when we, when we encode these different uh, physics equations into a computer model, uh, we have to make a decision, which is, um, which is what is the degree of pixelation in our model? So what is the resolution of our model? And really, the finer the pixelation, the better the forecast we could hope to get. If you, if you were able to um, predict what the temperature and wind speed was every, every 10 metres or so, you'd, get a, you'd end up with a very detailed uh, forecast and you'd be able to represent a lot of processes. Uh, if you contrast this to maybe having a, a data point every 10 kilometres, then you might think this is a lot, a lot coarser, a lot a bit cruder forecast. We take a, a supercomputer. And these are, I mean, I want to emphasize, these are some of the best supercomputers in the world. So, I mean, the one that's run at the UK Met Office is, is ranked about 30th in the world. And we take these machines and, and, we, and we fill them with weather forecasts. So um, we want to actually initialize a new forecast six, uh, four times a day, so every six hours. And then we, uh, we work out how fine our forecast can be in order to manage to complete within that six hours before we want to start the next one. There's always more processes that we, we, we believe are important for predicting the weather. And building a computer simulator is, is going to include some approximations. So, so the other thing we can consider is uh, what are the processes which we would ideally like to include in our forecast, but which we haven't because of computational constraints. So we can make our model more complicated as well as finer resolution or make it run, run quicker. And what information do we get from these weather models and from running the simulations? Yes, yeah, so we get a, a huge amount of information. Um, just like we need, to, we need to know what the temperature and wind speed is, etc., over the whole Earth and at every, at every height. This is the information that we also then get out. So our, our model will predict us these three-dimensional fields of, of, of kind of key variables. In addition, our models provide us with information about how we will experience the weather on the ground. So they, they pr make predictions of, you know, uh, rain, uh, rain rates, precipitation, uh, wind gustiness, uh, things like this, which really affect our experience of the weather. However, I want to stress that the output from the model is not really, is, is not the, the, the data that goes directly to the user. There's another important step uh, whereby you have meteorologists who interpret the output from the model to improve the forecasts that are given to the user. And that again comes down to the fact that uh, we've made some simplifications in, in making the model. Um, you know, if we think about this resolution issue, it might be that we've, you know, that the resolution is too coarse to include a particularly important valley or a mountain range for a, for a particular town. And we know that systematically our forecasts are a little bit wrong for that town because you don't get the effects of the mountain. 
And so this is something that you can correct for in a, in a post-processing step. Why is the information that we get out not 100% accurate? Ah, this is the key question. <laughs> the question that everyone wants to know. The key answer is that the atmosphere is what's called a chaotic system. Chaos theory is a very large area of, of maths research, really, which applies to a huge number of different fields. But it's worth remembering that it was discovered by a meteorologist. So it is very intimately tied to the atmosphere. Um, a chaotic system is one which has a sensitive dependence on its starting conditions. So if we remember, um, we were talking a little bit about how we estimate these starting conditions for our weather forecast model. So we need to have a three-dimensional um, estimate of temperature and winds, for example. But we, you know, we have a lot of data at the surface from from weather stations and we have some <clears throat> particular uh, lines going up into the atmosphere from a weather balloon. I mean, so there are going to be errors in our starting conditions. And for a chaotic system, it means that these errors, even though they could be very small, what we predict will happen is vastly different to what actually happens. Um, another, another problem is that we're, of course, trying to predict the future state of the atmosphere with a computer model. And we've made some simplifications and approximations, which mean that, you know, there, there might be some, uh, some errors introduced into the forecast along the way from, these, from, from the model itself. And again, these will amplify into the future. And so this is really what happened with the, the great storm of 1987. I mean, what Michael Fish had, what he was presented with from the, from the computers, uh, was a prediction that the storm would miss the UK. So they could see that a storm was coming, but the forecast was that it would swoop to the south. Um, actually, the atmosphere was teetering on a knife edge that night. And so actually what happened is that the storms did catch the south uh, of England and cause all that damage. So, but, I mean, actually, there's a, there's a fundamental thing that we do now, which we didn't do back in the 80s, which, which, um, which substantially improves our forecasts. And what we do is that instead of making a single best guess prediction for, for the weather coming up, we make a set of predictions. So we now make 50 forecasts for the weather over the coming week. And what we do is we try and account for the uncertainties in our forecast. So we make small changes to the starting conditions in our model. We make small changes along the, the evolution of the model as well to account for uncertainty in the, in the simulator itself. And then we can see how these different 50 different forecasts differ from each other. Uh, if you do that for the case of the great storm, uh, what you find is that uh, while, you know, three quarters of the members also show that you know, the storm misses the UK, there's an appreciable number of forecasts which show this very severe storm uh, catching the south of the UK. Maybe could you please tell us a bit about the research that you're doing and how that kind of ties in with that. So my own area of research is <clears throat> is mostly interested in how we can represent errors in our forecast because of the simplifications of our model itself. Um, so, the, so the particular um, uh, kind of property that we want to improve in the forecast uh, is, is to make sure that any probability distribution that we produce is, is actually a reflection of the actual probability of having an event. The problem with making these probabilistic forecasts is that the public can think you're just hedging your bets. You know, if you say, if you say 10% chance of rain and it does rain or it doesn't rain, you can't, you know, you, you said it might rain. <laughs> and so, and so the impression is that it's, it's just a way of, um, of hedging your bets. But I mean, what we can show statistically is that if you collect together all the days you make that forecast, it should rain on 10% of the days. Um, so my research is really interested in, in errors in our forecast which come about because of the simplifications we've made in building the model. In particular, uh, simplifications to do with this, this, um, uh, the, the processes that go on below the pixelation scale of our model. So, um, so we've, decided, we've defined this resolution um, below which we represent the, the atmosphere as essentially being constant. But of course, there's things going on at smaller scales which are important. So this includes um, clouds, for example, happen on scales smaller than a few kilometers. Um, turbulence, um, the way that the air interacts with the surface, um, the way that radiation interacts with the air. 
a key uh, a key approach which I use in my own research is to take a really high resolution uh, model simulation uh, simulation of the atmosphere and and use this to study how the atmosphere atmosphere really behaves and this is the idea is that this is what we would like our low resolution forecast to be able to mimic so by comparing the difference between this very high resolution simulation and a much lower resolution forecast model we we can begin to characterize um, effectively the errors in the low resolution forecast model. It's, it's interesting to note that this, um, this uncertainty is actually dependent on the state of the atmosphere. So we, we talked a bit about the great storm being a very uncertain, uh, uncertain uh, atmospheric state, but equally sometimes we get states of the atmosphere which are really very predictable. And so then what we want is that our forecasts remain very tight out to the future. If we make a, an ensemble, a, a kind of probabilistic forecast, the probability distribution will remain very close as we look out to the future. And then we know with great certainty that it's going to be sunny at the weekend. As we can see, it takes a large number of resources to monitor and forecast the weather. Complex models have been developed to predict the weather as best we can. With improvements in computer technology, growing observational networks and ongoing research, weather models and predictions will continue to improve in accuracy. But physics tells us that we can never be 100% sure of whether we'll need an umbrella today or not. Hi, the Oxford Physics YouTube channel is now publishing videos regularly. If you enjoy this video, then don't forget to subscribe and activate notifications so that you don't miss any future uploads. Thank you for watching.